Okay, guys. Hey, I'm James Barber, and uh, I am hosting today's uh, live stream with Ted McGrath. Ted's going to be on in a few minutes, but I wanted to get us started and get rolling. As you uh, are joining us, just to give you a little background, again, my name is James Barber, and uh, I work with Ted. I'm the one that directed Ted's one-man show. Good enough. I'm working with him on the Got Dreams platform. Uh, my background is I, I've started multiple Broadway shows and I'm in the entertainment world. Um, so uh, I'm working with Ted on building that. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Got Dreams platform and the vision that we have for it. And also, um, you know, this is this live stream is going to be about money. And we're going to talk about digital money in the 21st century. So um, as, as we get started, and as Ted's going to be coming on in a couple of seconds, I wanted to give you a little vision about what we have planned for the Got Dreams platform, which uh, some of you may be aware of. If you're not aware of it, uh, it's a pretty cool platform. I've actually interviewed close to 70 some odd people uh, from the entertainment industry, different levels of success in the entertainment industry. Um, and what we're doing is we're putting together a, a place where you can actually go and learn. Uh, we also have uh, entrepreneurs and, and business people on the advent of money and digital money so you can learn finance as well. And that's what's important for us in building this platform. Yes, we're getting your message out. Yes, we're teaching you how to market and get your vision out. But it's also important to understand how to utilize your funds and how to grow exponentially in your financial world so that you can create the stability that you want to have as we go forward. So that's what today is going to be about. When Ted comes on, we're going to be talking about digital money in the 21st century and how uh, and how we're going to be rolling that out as part of the Got Dreams platform and the things we have going forward. So um, for those of you who have not uh, been on these lives before, we're using a, a program called StreamYard. If you're on Facebook, um, and you want to put a comment in, you can go to StreamYard.com slash Facebook. And what that's going to allow us to do is to see who is actually commenting, because I'm not watching this on Facebook. I'm watching this on StreamYard. So if you haven't done so, go ahead and, and click that. If you're on YouTube, you can go ahead and just put your comments in. If you guys have any questions as we're coming up, again, Ted's going to be on here in a couple of minutes. Um, what are your questions about digital money in the 21st century? Do you have questions about it? Are you into crypto? Are you into Bitcoin? Uh, are you questioning how do you leverage yourself and how do you build your business at the same time as creating sustainable modes of income for you to move forward? It's something we talk about um, a lot within um, within the entertainment industry, right? So I spent my my life and I'm still in the entertainment industry. It is undoubtedly one of the most difficult professions in order to make a living. Um, there's a statistic, I think it's from 2016, uh, the union that governs professional stage actors. And I'm, I'm telling you this so that you understand how it's relevant to entrepreneurs, that 69% of all professional stage actors, these are the top in the world, are making $69,000 a year or less, right? No, I'm sorry, I was incorrect. $15,000 a year or less. The next 10%, 79%, between 69 and 79, make 50 grand a year. So even if you're at the top 79%, you're making $50,000 a year. That's like $35,000 after taxes, 39 grand after taxes. So how do you sustain while you're trying to, to reach your dreams and your goals? How do you sustain? So when I look at entrepreneurship and I look at the artist, they're kind of synonymous, right? Entrepreneurs are people that are out there applying their dreams, trying to make their dreams happen, while at the same time trying to generate enough income so that they can sustain to make their dreams happen, right? Well, that's kind of what Ted has put together for us, not only in Message to Millions, but also in the Got Dreams platform, because we're going to be able to show you how you can earn while you learn to create your dream. It's something that's really not been done before. You've seen the things earn while you play. You can go and play video games. Well, this is earn while you learn. And the more you create, the more you're going to be able to earn and actually grow. So I think Ted is here. Let me bring him on. Hey, buddy. How are you, man? I'm Welcome. good, man. I'm good. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah, so I, I was talking to the audience a little bit about the fact that, uh, you know, we, the, the, the program today is going to be about digital money in the 21st century. I was giving him a little bit of insight into Got Dreams, not a lot, and how 
I see the artist as an entrepreneur and, and the need to, to balance that and grow your income so you can sustain while you're trying to go for your dream. Um, and, uh, and, and, oh, Michael, Michael Manolini says, how should I start learning about crypto? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Well, thanks, thanks. So, thanks, James. So, yep. you know, obviously, we 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 started this whole Got Dreams platform, really for the the artist and the entrepreneur. We discovered that um, entrepreneurs have this creative side in, inside of them as well. Um, and it's funny when we launched Got Dreams initially, um, we launched it to my network of entrepreneurs in uh, you know with Ted McGrath Brands, and the response was overwhelming of how many entrepreneurs were interested in doing something creative or already artists and um, never did anything professional with it and wanted to reignite their hobby or um, they're like, hey, I want to do something professionally um, or they're tied to some foundation that has something to do with art. So it was just fascinating. Um, and, you know, the idea of, of everything that we're doing is like the, the next evolution um, of something that's going to help people thrive in the society. And I thought to myself, well, what better way to help entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs thrive um, who have an artistic side? What better way to help artists who are just like full blown? I'm an artist, but I can't get my message out to the world and my art out to the world because I don't know marketing, I know branding, and I don't know money, um, and I don't have the skill sets that I fully need. And uh, and initially, you know, I, I created it because when I started to do my, um, you know, my art and had my vision for my play... Um, you know, years ago, um, I started to do things for myself and I realized, wow, like, you know, if you're going to be artistic, you need to know marketing because you need an audience. And if you're gonna be artistic, you need to know money because you need to actually be able to fund the dreams of things that you're doing. So hence got dreams, which is a platform that helps artists, um, in those areas of the skill sets they need, the branding and marketing they need and the money that they need. And then we're so like 22nd century with what we're doing. I'm not going to get into all of that right now. But um, it's a pretty, pretty extraordinary thing that we're doing um, for the platform. So one of the reasons I started uh, Got Dreams, um, this this live stream right now on money is because I realized that a lot of my friends have, um, you know, uh, big questions in relation to um, uh, digital currency. And Michael just says, like, how do you get started in crypto? Like, what is crypto? Right. So how do you get started in it? Which is a good question. Right. Um, so. Um, I just started getting involved um, because of the problem that I saw, um, you know, uh, in March of 2020. And I realized that, um, you know, we're facing a huge, huge issue um, as it relates to what's going on in the economy. And, um, and I started to see that, um, you know, today, like when, when the Fed started printing money, I started to see, well, wow, like the Fed's, Fed's printing money. Like, obviously, if you just print money out of thin air um, and there's 20 percent more money in supply or 40 percent more money in supply, um, you have a problem because if there's more supply of it uh, in the world, the, what I hold, my own personal dollars are worth less um, because that's just how it goes. Like, you know, you print more supply of something and the value of the asset um uh, uh, decreases that you hold, the value of the currency that you hold, that you that you hold uh, decreases. So, um, so I just started to see the problem, and I got involved way back in 2017 in crypto, but I started to get heavily even more involved um, in uh, 2020 of last year when I just saw what was coming. And the reason we started this platform was because um, I was like, wow, we need to teach people about the future. Um, not only of uh, digital marketing, which is in the present, but we need to teach people about the future of digital money, um, because if you're ever going to get ahead to be able to fund your dreams and to get your dreams out to your audience in the world, you need to know something about money. So, you know, the most stable thing you can study, in my opinion, and again, I'm not giving any financial advice on this platform, is uh, is Bitcoin. Understand it. Understand what it is. Um you know, I still was hanging out with friends at dinner the other day who I've told them about it multiple times, sitting down, explained it to them. And they're like, well, what you, how do I buy Bitcoin? And I'm like, well, you have your account open. Why don't you just go press trade and buy it? And um, and the uncertainty is there because they don't understand that the, they look at the price and they go, the price was 54000 the other day. And now it's whatever, 57000 58000 
And so uh, people are like, is that the price is too high? The price is too high. And the first thing you should understand is that like, you know, there's there's like if you add up the different assets that exist in our economy in the U.S. alone, I think it's like five hundred tr trillion dollars of assets between all the money that's in stocks and bonds and real estate, et cetera. So you have five hundred trillion dollars of assets is floating around in the current monetary system. And you have to ask yourself the question, like because of inflation and because um, like bonds are no good today, in my opinion, um, you know, uh, you know, people don't fully understand real estate. They want to get involved and make a quick buck um, and they don't it's not their expertise and they haven't studied enough. It's a risky game um, because the market's inflated right now. So um, when you look at houses, right, the housing market's inflated. So stock market's inflated, right? It's up by the, the S&P 500 index is up by 34%. Um, which is typically would do eight to 10% over a, a time period. And that did 34% last year. And you wonder why, because you have the top 500 companies in there. And, and when the Fed's bailing people out, they're pouring money back into the companies. So what companies do you think they're pour, pouring money back into? The companies that drive the economy, the S&P 500, the top 500 companies. So they're dumping all kinds of printed money into these um, companies that haven't produced anymore. They haven't produced any more money um, they haven't, it's not like their, their revenues went up all of a sudden. It's just, no, they printed money and they dumped it in and the stock market went up. So you start to look at these fabricated, uh, vehicles. Um, and quite frankly, these, uh, these ancient vehicles like gold, you know, um, it's like, okay, well, uh, you know, uh, gold's great. It's an asset. It's also been around for thousands of years, you know, um, you know, you could still send letters, snail mail to people. And it's still reliable and your mail will get there. But wouldn't you rather send an email or wouldn't you rather get on the phone and send a text today? So it's the difference between, you know, old antiquated assets versus the future of where um, the entire economy is going, in my opinion, because 500 trillion of that wealth that exists is uh, there, there will be 100 trillion, in my opinion, um, that moves out over the next decade um, into uh, into. Uh, these uh, new um, digital currencies. Um, and so you're starting to see the evolution already. I think crypto is a $3 trillion marketplace at this point, maybe a little bit lower than that, depending on what the market is. Um, so you're not, you're not far off 33 X and you're a hundred trillion dollar, um, you know, market. Um, hey Ted, let me ask you this, yeah. because it's something that's interesting because, you know, we talked about crypto early on and then, you know, there, there's hesitancy and, like you said, you know, there are people that have, you know, Coinbase or whatever that whatever their thing is on their phone, and they just don't do it. Um, for those who are getting into crypto or thinking about it, or may may not have any understanding of it, can you talk about the different areas of the world that are now adopting it? Like we just saw that AMC, the theaters, the you know, the cinemas are accepting crypto as a payment to go see a movie. So. Can you talk a little bit about the mainstream of it? Sure. Uh, I mean, look at El Sal yeah. look at El Salvador. You know, I think uh, in El Salvador there's 4.7 million people, and one point something like that, and 1.7 million of them have money in a bank. So now they just issued uh, wallets. Wallets is a place where you hold your Bitcoin, right? So you need a wallet to hold your Bitcoin. It's one of the ways you can hold it. So they issued wallets. I think it was to, don't quote me on this. We need to look it up. But I think it was to 3 million people. Wow. Right? So, or maybe it was to a million people. We need to look at that up, look up the data on that. But they issued wallets. Let's just look it up. Number of wallets, number of wallets, of wallets, wallets uh, issued in El Salvador. Yeah, it's an it's an interesting thing because three million Salvador Salvadorians have acquired a Bitcoin wallet. Three million. Wow, three million. Three million. And so share, what's the share, what's the po what's the population of El Salvador? Let's look at that. But go ahead, James. Tell, say what I you're was saying. I was going to say what's interesting about that is when we were talking about it early on, and and you know, and I started in it, but then you started you really started digging down and looking at the research of it, and looking at the future, and looking at those others who were actually playing the game. And it's not this fly-by-night thing that people think it is. It is a stable uh, 
it is a stable mode for many, many people and businesses. Larger businesses are getting involved in this. Absolutely. And, you know, the population, to your point on mainstream, James, the population of El Salvador, based on November 30th, 2021, 6,532,000 people. So just under half. So 3 million got Bitcoin wallets, got wallets for their Bitcoin, and each of them got issued $30 um, by the government. So you have an entire population. Um, and, and think about it, before only 1.7 million of those people had their money in a bank. So when you look at, when you think about the mainstream of other countries that don't have banking systems like we do in terms of their population, the majority of their population having money in the banks, they need a banking system. Right. They need a place where people hold their money. There's other countries too where you put money into the bank and they charge you interest to hold money in the bank, guys. Right. It's how bad things have gotten. So, so when you look at like what what are people looking for for the solution? So, uh, you know, if you're if you're in El Salvador and you want to send money across the world to um, to your family, Western Union and the the fees to do stuff like that was anywhere between eight and thirty percent to send your money. The fee to send your money. So in Nigeria, it's higher, right? Nigeria is another country that has that problem. So you have Nigeria is a fast adopting country of Bitcoin as well. So you look at it just in the U.S. Okay, what's the adoption in the U.S.? Well, it, number one, put that aside for a second and look around the globe of what's happening. Okay, you have entire countries that are now adopting it. That's the first thing. Second thing is James is talking about you have like AMC movie theater, like hey, you know, come, you know, come put your Bitcoin <laughs> right, come here and you can pay with Bitcoin. Well, if you're you shouldn't be paying anybody with your Bitcoin, FYI. Okay, um, you need to hold on to your Bitcoin. But uh, uh, an AMC theater is smart. We'll accept money in Bitcoin because if they hold on to it, well, it's a way for them to double, triple, quadruple, 5X, potentially 10X over the next decade, right? So the question then becomes, like when I was sitting down with my friends the other night of like, but the coin's so expensive, it's $54,000. Well, one, when you, this is a, a misnomer, is like you don't need to buy a $54,000 worth of Bitcoin. You could literally go and buy $5 right now. On your account. So the thing that makes it valuable. Yeah, is I, I just bought ten dollars when you said just open your app and buy. I just bought ten. I yeah. just bought ten bucks. Well, ten bucks because you get in the mode, oh. you start watching, you get in the excitement of you want to buy or like you yeah. want to be part of something. And and the the question is the volatility, right? People talk about volatility. Hmm. Listen, anything that's new, a new asset, the reason you don't have that type of volatility in the S&P 500, though you had volatility up recently, right? Right. 34% because of the printing of money. That's why, right? But the reason you don't have that volatility anymore over the years is because when you have $100 trillion or $50 trillion into something, you're not going to have, if somebody, if, somebody move, if somebody moves out a billion dollars, it's not going to drop the price a bunch when you have $50 trillion in a fund, right? But with Bitcoin, where you have a trillion dollars in it, and somebody decides to inject 10 billion into it or remove 10 billion into it from it, you're going to have some volatility in the price. You see what I'm saying? So people go, well, it's so volatile. It can drop 10% in the day. But that's actually the attractiveness to something like this. Because while it can drop 10% in a day, it could run 30% in a month up. So like, who wants to buy into an old asset where you're not going to move the needle with it? You know what I'm saying? So you got to look at people want to get in at the ground floor when something started up. And they go, well, Bitcoin's dead. It's a $50,000. We're going to go more than that. I, my personal opinion is in the next decade, it'll be at a half a million. And I think that's a minimum per coin. So if you look at that and you go, okay, mainstream, what's happening right now? Like large corporations are just starting to move into it more. Okay, just starting to move into it. And that projection was done by, I think, Kathy Wood from ARK Investments, who said, if you just had the larger corporations in the world that took 5% of their balance sheet and put it into Bitcoin, you'd have a $560,000 Bitcoin whenever that happens. So it could be five years, it could be a decade, whatever. But if you just had the large the corporations who decided to take money and 5% of money that's on their balance sheet and put it in, just 5%, you could have $560,000 Bitcoin. That doesn't include all the other countries in the world. Right. That doesn't include governments. Like if you look at Wyoming, Wyoming's wanting to become a Bitcoin state. The Miami, the mayor of Miami is a huge supporter of Bitcoin. So that doesn't, that doesn't really include retail customers who are moving their money, like you and me are putting money right. into it. So you look at the potential of this thing, it's massive, James. Yeah, and you you mentioned something, you know, really interesting. And, and you know, in layman's terms, look, you don't put all of your money into one basket anyway. 
You know what I mean? You need to be a little diversified. So if you get into Bitcoin, that's a diversification. For for again, speaking in layman's terms, for yeah. someone who's like, you know, hey, I'm I'm new to Bitcoin. Yeah. What's the benefit for them in terms of they're going, oh, I, you know, I put money into a stock, I can see the stock go up and then I can liquidate it. Or, you know, if I invest in a piece of real estate, you know, then I invest in that and then I can sell that for a higher price. So what for uh, someone who is, is is coming into this anew, what is the benefit for them to start in the crypto world in terms of longevity, in terms of being able to, to leverage that Bitcoin? We talk about, you know, being able to leverage debt, yeah. um, those kinds of things, because if, if, if we can see that there's a benefit, then obviously people people will do it. Yeah, I mean, w one is you can put it in tomorrow. Like you could put it in tomorrow and let's say it goes up 30% in a month, you know, or 10% in a month. You can liquidate the entire thing with the press of a button. You know, whereas like, you know, you can literally with press of a button. And right. so the, the ability to the technology is so simple. Like I could literally sell something today and transfer it to another bank account in the same day. That's how right. liquid the, cat, the, the ability of Bitcoin is. So that's number one. Number two, um, it is like it, it, because it's written by a computer, you know, code, which created Bitcoin um, and it has only 21 million coins. Right. So when it the code was written, people always, well, what is Bitcoin? It was written by a code. Right. Computer code. This is interesting. I love when you explain this. Yeah. And and the rules of the code, there's the rules of the game. Right. Were written to where there will only be 21 million Bitcoin. There will never be any more. OK. So the, 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 the metaphor or the analogy is it's digital gold is the analogy people use. Right. And so when you're looking at Bitcoin, it's not it's not a currency at this point, although it can be used where you can go pay for a ticket at AMC theater. It's it's more looked at as a store of value. And so, like, when you want to preserve your wealth, people would put their money into gold. Right. Well, now, if you want to preserve your wealth, my personal opinion for myself is I put my money into Bitcoin. OK, and it becomes a store of value of the money I've worked so hard for um, and that I've spent years and years working for. Well, if I keep it in cash last year with inflation, I lost 20 percent of the value of my cash. Mm. Right. So if I just keep it in cash, the inflation was 20 percent last year, guys, because the money supply got printed by 25 or 30 or 35 percent more. Forty percent, I think it was in the last two years. So just by holding money in cash, I'm losing money. OK, it's a real thing, but you don't see it. You just see at the end of the year, if I had a, if I had a thousand dollars in cash at the end of the year, you go, I still have a thousand dollars in cash. No, you don't. You have a thousand dollars physically in cash or hypothetically in cash, but you actually lost 20% of that value because of inflation, um, which has resulted from the printing of the money supply. Okay. Now, why does that make Bitcoin for me? I'm not giving financial advice to you, but why did it make a better investment for me? It was simple. I like, I didn't want to sit and keep money in cash and lose 20% just sitting there. It's called the invisible tax. So what did I do? I moved it into the digital gold, you know, and if you look at gold, just go look at the returns on gold. This year, it's like negative 0.64% on gold right now. Okay. I wasn't going to put my money in gold. Why? The gold is for, 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 in my opinion, it's dinosaur age. Okay. So I was like, well, where am I going to put my money? If I have to outpace 20%, right, inflation, where am I going to put my money? The bonds aren't going to give me that. Gold's not going to give me that. Certain stocks may give me that. Right. Like I put my money in Tesla last year. That certainly did it. OK, S&P 500 is, is it's an, it's overinflated. It's just printed money put into these companies. It's it's not a, th a real 34 percent value that you got in the S&P. Right. You're, now your money is there if you invested in it. But now I'm not going to buy the S&P now. It's overinflated. So I'm going to put my money in the S&P 500 index right now. So where are you going to put your money? Where are you going to put it? You know, it's interesting talking about that just to, to to hop on that because people say, well, what about real estate? Well, in certain cities, in certain states, real estate itself is inflated. So you're going to be buying a home or a property right now. And, and I love real estate. I love, you know, multifamily, the cash flow. But if you're going to buy a house, that market eventually is going to come down. So the house you bought for $600,000 could in a year's time 
be worth five hundred thousand dollars, right? It's it's an interesting game to play about yeah, where you're going to put it. And it is, and it's like, okay, well, you know, people who are real estate experts, like Grant Cardone's smart, and he's a real yep. estate expert, and that's how he's built his wealth. He's obviously yep. not going to move all of his wealth over to Bitcoin because he's built up an empire and it works for him, right? Yep. And I'm not saying it doesn't work for other people either. Certain people have expertise, want to play that game, et cetera. I'm just not interested if I'm going to invest with somebody because how many of you are going to go out and buy apartment buildings yourself? Most likely you're not, you know? The great majority of people are not going to do it because it's too much work. You got to get on planes. You got to go travel. You got to have the expertise. You got to spend the knowledge. You got to spend the time where you're on the road traveling to go do the thing. You might go to a state and go look at the property and not even like it and then go to another one. And I'm not saying it doesn't have amazing tax benefits and it doesn't have recurring revenue and it's not a solid asset you can touch. I think it's a smart investment for the person who really wants to do it as a career. But when I look at the future of where the future is going, right? Right. So is real estate still an option for some for certain people? Absolutely. I'm not ruling that out. It's not it's not an interest to me as the primary thing. So when I looked at the opp opportunities of like, OK, I, I, I like this real estate thing is smart. But then I looked at speed. I looked at mobility. I looked at where the future is going with technology. And I started to say, ask myself the question of like, you know, everything that you know, most things that you've known, music went digital, books went digital, you know, businesses went digital. You'd ha I would have to be a fool. I would have to be a fool to think that money's not going digital. Fool. Okay. Personally, myself. That's the way, that's why I was looking at it. So when I saw the trend, I was like, well, I can put it up into something that over the last 12 years has gone up by 100% a year. Okay. So if, if the 12 years has been around. It's not like we're talking about a new thing here. Your Bitcoin's been around since 2008, guys. This is going on its 13th year. Okay. I, and and so I can I can look at that opportunity and go, that, that's smart. Okay. Secondly, it's a trillion dollar asset. There's four or five trillion dollar companies on the face of the planet. Google, Tesla, which just became one, Microsoft, Apple. So... And so that's another reason to look at why now, now you're investing in a trillion dollar asset. That's still, it's pretty big at this point, right? So when you look at putting your money to something that's a trillion dollars, that's kind of a smart move. It's not like you're investing in something that's not proven at this point. Right. So, so that's how I kind of look at the decisions of it, James, and the speed at which you can send money today. Um, and you can just, with the press of a button, send it to somebody across the globe. Um with, right. with regular money, you got to call the damn banker and they got to verify yourself on the phone. You spend 45 minutes on a transaction you can do in a bank. Yeah. You don't think that banks are going to be obsolete soon. And by the way, another platform to look at that I invested in is Ethereum, because when you talk about the new uh, financial system, right? So we're talking about Bitcoin as a store of value. But if you look at Ethereum, you have entire ecosystems of business platforms being developed on that. So Ethereum, while it is, is its own digital currency, you have business being built on top of money. So imagine businesses being built on top of the internet of money. This is what this is, the internet of money. And so now you have an entire ecosystem of businesses built on the money system. Do you think it's going to be faster? Do you think it's going to be more mobile? Do you think technology and all types of innovations are going to be moving towards this? Yeah, it's why it's being called Web 3.0. And now on these platforms, decentralized finance decentralized means no central institution controls it decentralized finance is a huge thing that's bringing up because you can now go online if you own bitcoin i could literally go online right now and i could go and get a loan off my bitcoin right now well that alone I, see now that alone gives credibility right because banks are looking at it going what are they banks that are giving loans or are they independent people that are giving loans how does that work it's institutions. Go look up like uh, an example. I'm not, I'm not recommending this, but you look up like if I wanted to go to Salt, it's a lending company, right? So I can right. literally go deposit my Bitcoin in there and have an approval process within 24 hours, 48 hours, right? Because right. I go take my Bitcoin. Now I put, I'm leveraging my Bitcoin. Now I'm not recommending doing it. I haven't done this. I wouldn't, I don't want to leverage my Bitcoin, right? But if I needed money to do that, I could actually do that. So you have entire financial systems that are springing up to where to go get a loan now, like you, you just here's my Bitcoin, right? You yeah. What's interesting is that then, because again, more credibility for this, just from an outside point of view. It, like you know, I'll be playing devil's advocate, right? So you have companies that are going to loan out cash and large sums of cash, just like a bank would, based on someone's Bitcoin. So that company who's loaning it must see the value in the Bitcoin, otherwise they wouldn't do it. Right, because if if they lost, if Bitcoin went belly up, then then they're out the money. Um, yeah, 
Let and me these are all, these, these are obviously all com these are companies that are built on the web, you know, 3.0 platform. That's what this right. new technology is being called the web 3.0 platform. You go to your banker, they don't even acknowledge it as an asset. So if I go to my banker to try to get a loan on my bank, they don't even acknowledge it as an asset. But you know, and I get it. And I said to my banker the other day, I get it. You guys, ha you guys are slow on the adoption curve. You have to be very conservative. So banks will kind of be the last that's moving into it. But you have major, major, you know, hedge funds have already obviously, you know, uh, have a Bitcoin in their portfolios and Ethereum. Um, you have, you know, co corporations that have put their treasury into, um, you know, Bitcoin, um, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so uh, you have Square, you have PayPal. So it's just a matter of adoption, right? Of more people adopting it. It takes longer time for larger institutions to adopt like banks and corporations because they have more regulations and more hoops that they need to jump through. So you expect the curve to be longer, but the adoption curve um, every year for people who are, who, are, who are now opening, like becoming users on the platform and, and opening up wallets, the adoption curve um, is faster than the internet was when the internet was at this point. So right around 1997, when the internet was at, um, I think it was 150 million users, um, the adoption curve was something like 63, 64% a year. Okay. So the number of people getting on and using the internet. And you remember back in that day in 1997, I didn't use the internet. I wasn't even interested in it. I was like, I'm not going to use this thing, whatever. I would just go talk to people. So the, the, as of last year, um, this is older data. But um, present time, I don't know precisely what it was, but, you know, several months back, it was about 150 million users who were on, who, who, who were on this on these platforms, right, on the right. blockchain. And now the adoption curve is is growing fast in the Internet because when the Internet was 150 million, it was growing by 63 percent a year, year of the number of people that are adopting and using the Internet. Well, now with with uh, the blockchain technology, it's growing by double that 113 or 114 percent a year of the number of people who are adopting this new technology of uh, a blockchain technology, which is what Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these coins reside on. So right. the adoption curve is double. It's double. It's incredible. We have a question from our Facebook user. By the way, guys, if you're on Facebook, uh, we'd love you to go to StreamYard.com slash Facebook because StreamYard does not allow us to see who you are if we're live streaming to Facebook unless you... Uh, unless you uh, uh, go to this uh, link and I'll put it again. So this, this Facebook user don't know who you are. So um, if you do to that link, I'll put it up there in a second. What books or resources would you recommend to someone who is interested in learning more about digital currency? Well, I'll Bitcoin tell you the people Ethereum. that I, that I, I, I like to study and follow. I think on Bitcoin, Michael Saylor to me is the best because um, he has a long-term view of it. Um, right. And he's an intelligent person. He has to have that perspective because he owns a company. Um, so his, his story of what he did, he's a total innovator in the space of the corporate world. Definitely, uh, he, he's, he wasn't a fast adopter of Bitcoin back in 2012, 13, 14, 15, when it came out or even 17, but recently in the last, uh, you know, year and a half to two years, um, his entire, uh, treasury, um, of the company is in Bitcoin. Um, so fascinating case study for a business person to take a look at that, uh, number one, um, another guy and, and, and Michael's macro. So he gives you a macro understanding of it. You're going to have to look up a lot of words cause he is an engineer. And so he uses some sophisticated words, but he's great to follow and learn from the macro perspective of why it makes sense. Uh, Raul Powell is another one on Ethereum. He's a big Ethereum person. And so he talks from a macro perspective on that. Um, those are the two people that I like to, uh, to follow, um, and really learn from. So um, there's another, you know, if you want to watch what's going on in the news under Bitcoin News Today, I can't remember what the guy's name is, but just if you look at Bitcoin News Today, he always has an arrow with the price of like Bitcoin going to this. He always breaks down Bitcoin. Um, so that's a good, good one to follow, just get the dump of the news of what's going on. But those are the two that I would look up to just get a macro understanding of it. Um, you know, you can get into like pricing models of that predict what the price are going to be, but like nobody has a crystal ball of what the price is going to be uh, a month from now or six months from now or even five years from now. So there's all kinds of people you could follow that talk about the the uh, the financial projection and financial models. Uh, Plan B is one of them. Uh, look them up. Plan B. Um, he talks about the you know, the future predictions based on like financial models. So if you're interested in that type of stuff, it's fun to follow. Um, has it been accurate up until this point? His prediction in November was not accurate at all. Um, he was predicting a ninety eight thousand dollar Bitcoin, and I think we're in December already. So 
Um, but up until that point, he was accurate for every three months leading up to that or something. Mm -hmm. So he's an interesting one to check out. So it depends if you like more micro chart stuff, he would be a good one. Willie Wu is another one on Bitcoin. He's good to follow. Um, he's he's He goes into the chart analysis of things. So, um, and then you just get on and just just take a look and, and see if it makes sense. But ultimately you got to get just gather the information and use your own judgment and just kind of understand the principles of why it is, uh, for me personally, it's a smart move and it is um, one of the smartest moves I've made financially. And I also got involved back in 2017 and 18 and 19. So, um, you know, and I've also bought all along the way, you know, all the way up to 60,000, I was still buying Bitcoin. So I've dollar cost averaged it into it. So those are people that you can take a look at. Yeah. Let me, let me, um, that's good stuff, man. And, and it's so funny because spending time with you, I start to follow Michael Saylor and these guys, um, and you learn, and it's just about education and, and, you know, so often people make decisions, I think, without having the the information to make the decision in front of them. They're going to go off with somebody's opinion or somebody's thought. And the only way that I can really make a choice for myself, whether it's doing something or not doing something, is to actually go and look at the information itself. Do the research for myself, because only then am I going to know. I, I want to transition for the end of our, our live stream into something that is digital. It's mm -hmm. uh, becoming, in a, in a way, a way for people to make money. Uh, it harkens to our artistic things, and those are NFTs because NFTs are are digital artwork that exist on the internet, and people are exchanging sometimes for very high amounts of money. So, can you talk about NFTs in the digital world? Because I think that that would be a cool way to uh, segue into the artist and being able to sustain as an artist. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I can talk about on that, cause it's not my thing really. Um, because to me, like, you know, it's, uh, it's speculative, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so like, I, do I like to play in those games a little bit? Yeah. Um, but I would just suggest to people that you get researched on it. You look at what it is. It starts, it stands for non fungible token. First look up what that means. Right. And it could be art, but it could be other things as well. Um, so I think you just need to take a look at what that is. Um, uh, and in terms of what, like, you know, I, my, my brother's very big into it. Um, and I kind of stick to, uh, I, st I stick to kind of the macro perspective of what's going on. Like I'm into Bitcoin, I'm into Ethereum, I'm into the metaverse, which is the, the virtual reality um, of basically, um, web 3.0, right? So it's like more and more people are moving virtual, um, which does speak to NFTs like, okay, art is moving digital and virtual. Right. But when I look at the, the big perspective of where is the future technology going? Um, we all know that when COVID hit, um, that people had to transition their lives into a digital world, whether you liked it or not. And so, what that started to create was, and this is um, the, the founder of Ethereum was sharing this the other day because they asked him the question about, you know, Mark Zuckerberg getting involved in the metaverse and Facebook rebranding their name to Meta. Um, it doesn't mean that Facebook owns the Meta space. Mark was just smart to look at it and go, hey, we're going to call ourselves Meta. So people think that we own it, whether that's smart or whether you agree with it or not, whatever it is, he did it. And um, if you look at it, the, the founder of Ethereum gave a good answer. He said, you know, as COVID hit, um, he said that people were looking for a better quality life in the digital world. And to improve that quality of life of the digital world, if you're going to live on computers, we have to innovate. And so you imagine now, like, you know, attending a concert that's online. Well, these are things that are all happening in this, in this metaverse right now. Imagine going into a casino and you know paying admission to go into a casino and be part of the casino and play the games like these are all things that are happening online from anywhere um, in the world yeah imagine buying land like uh, there's people who are buying land there was a transaction just done yesterday for seven hundred thousand dollars for a piece of virtual land and you got to think about well what are people doing to improve their quality of life they're creating an, a digital experience to where they can have a better quality of life. So if I can attend a concert, if I could go into a casino, if I could go see digital art that exists there and and now be like, wow, this is amazing, right? I got, I got you know, uh, digital art on my phone right here. Look, it's a trend. I'm cool, right? What NFT to invest in? It's not my game at all. Um, I haven't ventured into that. We are creating NFTs for our platform um, um, for what we're doing. 
Um, and we have some being designed right now, but that's for our platform. That's for our own artistic expression to make what we're doing kind of unique. So, um, so you just need to look into it. Um, and I research it, uh, the metaverse, and I've researched the upcoming, uh, you know, uh, companies that are, are, um, that I think are going to be, um, fantastic. I'm not going to share what they are because they're very speculative, but, um, you should check it out and it'll blow your mind what's going on. And you'll, you'll first start to wrap your head around, like, how is this possible? Like who, who's going to want to buy like land in the digital world? Well, I mean, in the internet, did you want to buy domain names so you could have a piece of your own land up there? Like kind of domain is kind of like your street name. That's yeah. super, super interesting. Yeah. I never you had your thing. So did, did you want to do that? Yeah. So now, now imagine more of a 3D virtual experience where now people don't just come to your website, but they walk into your, your room and they see your art on the wall, you know, or they see you doing a concert virtually with some avatar. These are all things that are happening. These are things that we're going to be developing on God Dreams because whether you like it or not, or whether you can wrap your head around it or not, metaphorically, it's already happened on Web 2.0. Like those of you own brick and mortar business, you're like, how are you going to transact and do business online? Corporations that were like, like, you know, I remember Michael Saylor saying in an interview, if people didn't, didn't come into the office, I would have fired them a year and a half ago. Well, now when COVID hit, everything was done on Zoom. So things that couldn't be imagined before because of the way you currently live life um, now have to be reimagined because we are in a virtual world and the threats of things that are going on, whether you believe them or not, it's keeping people inside. So the quality of life has to improve. The creativity has to still be expressed. And if you can't do it in a concert hall now, or you can't do it on Broadway, or you can't do it where, where else are you going to do it? In your living room? You're going to do it in your living room with an audience of people, but your living room is going to be a 3D room where people can put on glasses and have the experience and be sitting there in the concert hall with you while you deliver a, a song. <laughs> this is happening. The technology is already out. And this is where the world's going. Um, so I look at it and go, because I know, no, no, this is exactly where the world's going. It's why I invested in Bitcoin. It's why I invested in Ethereum. And if you just think logically, it's impossible for it not to go that way. And you can listen to, P, you know, 2013, I said this on the last one to Hillary Clinton. And I'm, I don't have it. I'm not going to tell you my opinion about her either way. I'm not going to get political. 2013, uh, Bitcoin's fake money. In her statement recently, um, we need to, countries need to be worried about Bitcoin because they could destabilize the dollar. Well, how, how is fake money going to de destabilize the dollar? Answer that question for me. So, you know, if you don't listen to the opinions of what people are saying who are threatened by it, listen to the facts of what are actually happening right now and do the research and get the data of people who are actually involved in it. Because if you ask some of these other people, they don't even know what it is. They're just afraid of it. So they got to say, no, 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 no. Watch the data. Listen to the people who are involved in it. Do your own research and then see, does it make sense? Does it make sense for the internet of money, which is what being called to have businesses built on top of it? Does it make sense for businesses to have more virtual experiences where people can have a better experience um, participating in live streams like this or a better experience with art where they could get it faster and better and and have an experience in the digital age where it's 3d it, do you think that's not going to happen if you think it's not going to happen and tell me the planet you're living on because maybe i'll come up there and hang out with you <laughs> you know it's really fascinating because you know you can um right now even even when i got it because i got the oculus glasses you can actually sit no matter where you are in the world and get a, a courtside seat at a Lakers game. And you're sitting literally on the court. And you can be in Japan and watch the Lakers game. Right. You can imagine, obviously, we have Zoom. Zoom exploded during the pandemic. But can you imagine then putting on your glasses and instead of it being one dimensional, we're all sitting around. Imagine us being in a room, having this conversation, 3D with everyone in this room live yeah and zuckerberg's yeah. got zuckerberg's got 2000 whatever you think of facebook is your opinion but zuckerberg is zuckerberg is smart he's got 2000 developers right who are um uh one to two thousand developers who are working on this whole metaverse right now yeah and, and they bought oculus they bought the right. 3d technology yeah and they have it and per per what he said you're gonna your, your pair of sunglasses your regular pair of sunglasses in the next couple of years the technology will be out where you put on sunglasses and you'll literally be able to see things in 3d 
So James and I are having this conversation. It'll be like he's sitting in my living room or having a discussion. And those of you who are watching will be like sitting in the living room. If you want to do a live stream, wouldn't it be more cool to sit in the living room with each other than just do it this way? Of course it would be, which is why they're pouring resources and resource into it. So whatever your opinion is of like, okay, well, it's going to destroy the current world of what's going on. It doesn't have to. It's more about smarter, intelligent people like you and me getting involved and doing things that can actually provide good in the world like we are with the artistic nature of things. Um, and, and knowing what are your causes, what are the things you believe in, what are the things that you want to develop, deliver a better quality of experience for people where it's faster, it's better, it's global, where it, it serves people in other countries that don't have some of the, 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 uh, the benefits that we have with technology and money and things of that nature. So how could you make a better experience in the planet instead of avoiding it? If you avoid it, you're just going to get the people who may abuse it and uh and then use it and then you'll just blame the technology but if you get involved and you have a voice in it then maybe you can do good with it because there's always going to be people who do good with it and do bad with it right just like the whole thing of like you know bitcoins being used by criminals and using come on man like where's, where's your research coming from right any technology that comes out of course criminals are going to freaking move towards that to some degree because they need a way to actually utilize better technology to hide the things that they're doing but it doesn't make the technology itself bad right? So, so people come out with these wild things. And if you look at the statistics on it, go look up the statistics, you know, on like money that's been laundered through Bitcoin and things of that nature. They're so low comparatively the laundering that goes on in the rest of the world. You know, I mean, what would the large institute, I'm not going to say the names, but they got a billion dollar fine recently and fines for what they were doing illegally with money. And they got a slap in the wrist and a billion dollar fine. And how many billions did they make off this? These are the financial institutions, some of them that exist already. And people are worried about, oh, our criminal is going to use Bitcoin. Come on, right? So the arguments for, uh, for against these things are so ridiculous, right? Even Elon's argument about the energy usage of Bitcoin was, I think, was ridiculous. And I think you had to take that standpoint and view because he works with a sustainable company and he had to be a good steward of it. And he didn't back out of it. He just said, how can we make it more sustainable? But the fact that it was an energy suck around the world when it's just going to make everything more efficient is kind of a ridiculous perspective. OK, Especially. so so I think you just need to open your eyes and look at it from your own viewpoint and uh, and 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 know that certain people have viewpoints because of of the industry they're in or the politics that they're in or the lack of knowledge and the ignorance that they have around the topic. Get educated, study the data for yourself and make up your own point of view. Don't just listen to somebody because they're an opinion leader and then they go, oh, I'm I'm a, I, I'm worth billions of dollars or I hope they hold this political position. So what I say is gold. Go do your own research. Be smart. It's a great way to end this uh, wonderful chat. Hey, for you guys, remember, we go live multiple times a week on different topics, on finance and on marketing, obviously in the Facebook groups, on uh, on uh, YouTube as well. So, Ted, as we're going out, um, give us one piece of advice that we should look at to do this week to help our understanding of the digital uh, currency and moving forward. In our I would just go watch a couple of vi videos, several videos on Bitcoin and Ethereum. Just go on YouTube, Google them. You know, I would like look up Michael Saylor, understand it because the genesis is Bitcoin. So understand it. Um, you'll get all kinds of other things marketed to you. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of coins out there. So many of them will fail, right? And some will succeed. Um, but one that has succeeded already and is here to stay for sure is Bitcoin. And in my other opinion, the other one is Ethereum. Um, so and my personal opinion on where the majority of my money is, is in Bitcoin, um, is where the majority of my money is. So um, so I would just, you know, that's what I would say to you. And um, uh, go get educated on it and take a step to, to learning about it and embracing uh, what's happening rather than, you know, maybe just thinking that it's a fad because it's not. Fantastic. And as always, guys, you can, you know, look at Got Dreams for some great uh, educational stuff, both on the, uh, the entertainment world and in the business world uh, that Ted has created himself. So I want to thank you guys for being here. Next time, turn on your notifications in the Facebook groups. Just turn them on, and that way you're going to get notified every time Ted goes live. Uh, you can also do the same thing if you're, if you're on the YouTube page. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you follow Ted on all the social media channels as well. You know, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. We're on TikTok. I mean, TikTok. TikTok, baby. Tick -tock. Yeah, and more to come. I think we have another show tomorrow. We have another show coming up on what? When is it? Uh, I believe it's you know, when, what's today. Yeah, tomorrow, Wednesday. You're, tomorrow. you're with Mike. And that's, on, that's more on messaging and marketing and all of that. So we, we have different shows coming. We, we're going to have Got Dreams for We have Got Dreams for Artists as well. 
So we have all kinds of shows that are coming up. We have another special on God Dreams for our, our different causes that we believe in and, and things that we want to support to make the world a better place, such as Drug Free World. So um, we've got a lot of cool things that we're going to be doing just to bring awareness to the public because we're all in this together. We need to make a difference together, but we need to be educated as a group of what's going on in the virtual world so we can do good with it and be and ride the wave and not get crushed with what's happening in the mainstream world. It's amazing. And guys, if you need any help with your messaging or any of that, send a message to the Facebook groups. Send a message right to the Ted McGrath uh, instant, message uh, message or instant messenger DM and someone will get back to you and set up uh, a call for you to talk to somebody uh, and we can, we can grow together. Ted, brother, thank you so much. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate right. it. Thanks. Thanks to you guys for being here. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Don't forget, turn on your notifications. Turn on your notifications. That way you'll know when Ted's going live and he'll be live again tomorrow. All right, everybody, have a great week. Thanks for watching.